everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we are here with an interview I've been re really looking forward to uh, with Rob Manning, who heads up, uh, well, actually, right now, he is the, what, what's your position now at JPL, Rob? I am, I am the uh, chief engineer for the uh, Low Density Supersonic Decelerator Project, which is a very terrible name for a project to try out uh, new, and test new supersonic parachutes that are larger, uh, that allow us to, to land stuff that's a little bit bigger than Curiosity Rover. Oh wow! So that's a that's an exciting project that you're working on then. It is. It's really cool. So it it's, it never it never gets old at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, does it? It ne no. It's there's never a dull moment for a second. <laughs> now before this, you've you've had quite an interesting career. So you were uh, the chief engineer of the uh, Mars Pathfinder in the '90s, right? In '97, '98 is when that landed, right? It, it landed in 1997, uh, July 4th. Uh, we started in the uh, early 90s and uh, put this very low-cost uh, lander on the surface of Mars after after 20-year hiatus of without exploring Mars. Uh, the Vikings landed the first successful missions, the, 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 the scientific missions on the surface were the two Viking landers, Viking 1 and Viking 2, in 1976. And uh, after that, there, wasn't, there was a big 20-year gap of exploration until... Uh, partly because of the, the stuff is so darn expensive. So we came and tried to prove that you could do something relatively low cost. And so for the cost of a major motion picture, we landed Pathfinder and it bounced on the surface and opened up like a flower. And a little rover Sojourner, about the size of a microwave oven, drove off and explored an area about the size of your backyard. It was an amazing thing to watch. So I, I was I was home from that? I think I just I was in between my junior and senior year of college, and it was really? July Fourth weekend, and I'm I'm watching this on CNN because there wasn't a live stream you could watch in ninety it was ninety seven right that was the year that it Correct. landed. And, wow. and I was, I, everybody was like, oh, you got to, you know, it's July 4th, we've got to, I'm, I'm not leaving the house until I see a picture from that rover. And uh, it was on the front page of the Hartford Current here in Connecticut the next morning. It was a yeah. huge spread across, all across the country. That must have been awesome to be it was, it was, it was so surreal that, not, I mean, it was just an, an amazing day, um, first landing this vehicle. And then um, as, the, as the sun rose on Mars, we finally got everything deployed and the cameras out taking, taking pictures. Uh, and of course, we didn't take a lot of pictures. We took that one. We call it the uh, the kind of the postcard panorama uh, of, and it just happened to have. Um, and, well, was it, we designed it to have a little Sojourner rover in front of us, and then out in the distance were these two little peaks called Twin Peaks, and it was sort of this fantastic uh, 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 view of right with and this fantastic rock garden right in front of us. It was just an amazing combination, and it all showed up just in time for the 6.30, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock news back east. And uh, it was just a phenomenal day um, that, that everything seemed to click. It was weird. It was, it was amazing. And, and it was too, great, too, that you solved the problem. I guess the last 20 feet are the hardest, <laughs> the hardest part of the mission, right? So well, just that, bounce that, it, right? That sudden stop at the end yep. that can get you every time. Right. So this, this kind of, uh, I guess there was still some risk involved. You could have a, a rock puncture the, the airbag, but it, there was far less risk bouncing until you stopped versus trying to come down on a rock, right? Well, it, 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 in fact, it probably did come down on, on a rock, and, and uh, the airbags probably protected it because it was the air, area where the, uh, where the uh, vehicle landed was just full of these very sharp and pointy rocks. Um, and so it was, a, uh, it was a pretty dramatic landing site. Um, and you know, the reason we didn't use rockets to slow down is because back in, back in those days, um, the, the technology that to use throttled rocket engines, hydrazine engines, had actually vanished in the 20 years since the Vikings landed. So we really didn't have a way, a technological way to land a, a vehicle on Mars using uh, throttled rocket engines to slow itself down on the surface. And so... It was it was uh, uh, the airbags were, were kind of like the, the kind of the poor man's choice for landing something on Mars, and at the time it was considered very radical and very avant-garde. And that wasn't the only radical design because uh, you you continued your career there. You did another airbag landing on Spirit and Opportunity, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, and then you uh, became the chief engineer on Mars Curiosity, which was very unconventional. And you write a lot about that in your book. And we should mention that we're interviewing you today because you have a book out. Uh, it is called Mars Curiosity. You can find it on Amazon, and it's a, a really uh, wonderful book. I'm about two-thirds of the way through it already now, and uh, I am really enjoying it, and I'm sure it was a, a labor of love to, to, to write that book. So um, 
you know, was it was it really something to go back and, and look at everything? And, and did you th rem remember things that you forgot about when you were putting that book well, together? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, my biggest problem is I had so many stories to tell, and m many of them were actually uh, not told because the book I didn't have the time. I had a little a, a due date with the publisher, so I, the stories I told were the ones they happened to get down on paper first. Uh, but it was because it was it's a very long and and kind of a sordid story to get this thing going. And I had to get it off my chest. I wanted to, first of all, I think a lot of people think that uh, landing on Mars is a uh, 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 is something we just know how to do. It turns out it's not just landing, but roving on a surface of another planet. It turns out it's very difficult and it's so big and so complicated that a lot of people, uh, I wanted people to realize that these things are really hard. And, and I, the fact that we made it look easy is just a veneer um, that that you know, that we painted because we had no, you know, we just had to make it work and it and appeared to work as far as everyone else was concerned. But the road to get there was remarkably difficult. And, so, and it's just an amazing story, just because every every solution to every problem creates more problems, right? It's a, it's exactly. a never ending cascading effect, right? It is, and 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 there and with curiosity, particularly, it was a so so much more stuff that we had to do. I mean, it was. It was uh, it was five times more massive. It had um, many times more science instruments on it, uh, and each one of those were vastly more complicated. It had far more difficult requirements. You know, it had um, it, first of all, it, it, it seems ironic today because the rovers are in fact more than you know they've lasted uh, both Spirit and Opportunity rovers, I should say, um, lasted. Uh, more, much more longer than their 90-day design limit. So we we design when I say we design them for 90 days. That means the great thing about 90 days, I don't have to worry about redundancy, hardware failures. Right. I only have, the only reason we said 90 days is because um, we when we did the math for how much dust accumulated on the solar panels on Spirit, on, on, I'm sorry, on Sojourner and Pathfinder. Your Pathfinder lander when it opened up like a flower had solar panels on its pedals. And so we could after after uh, 80, 87 days on the surface of Mars. So how long it lasted? It accumulated about you know quite a, so much dust that uh, it, there was hard, there was far less sunlight on the solar panels than at, at the end of the mission than was at the beginning. So we assumed that was going to happen with Spirit and Opportunity. So when we did the math and calculated so much so much how much the dust would accumulate, we just, we and for the size of the rover and the size of the solar panels. We said, "Hey, this thing's this thing can't last more than about three months on the surface of Mars." And NASA said that was fine. We're we're doing there to go, to do a quick geology to check. This these rovers were not complicated. They, you know, I like to tell people when um, if you've ever get a chance to go on a field trip with a geologist, take it. It's it's one of the most fun experiences. The reason it's so much fun is because geologists can actually do something that most scientists can't do. They can look out at the rocks around them, look at all the layers, and, and look, and, for, and for, especially in a place like the Southwest where you can actually see the rocks and the layers. But if you, if, if you they, they will see the, or, the order of events. They will be able to see which layers laid on top of each other, what happened when, whether or not that was an intrusion, whether that was a fault, whether it was that that was a fold, and what happened. So the, you can get in real time a story of what's going on on Earth. And so so what we wanted to do is send a roving geologist so we could do those field trips and get that kind of that real time science just simply by looking at the geomorphology, the shape of the rocks. The sh the, and if we brought a very simple mineralogical uh, uh, spectrometer, the Mossbauer spectrometer and the, uh, the thermal emission spectrometer, which is a device that looks at the, the, the color of the light um, from the rock. Um, and we also had a, a, a device that actually looks at the a atomic composition, the alpha spectra, the, the, uh, the, the elemental composition on the end, end of the robotic arm, then with all those things combined, we could actually do some real-time geology. And if you only had 90 days, well, that's not, that's not a lot of time, but you can do a lot of quick geology by roving around. And that's what, that was the whole idea of these roving geologists. Um, the and opportunity is still working 10 years later, right? It's still yeah, going. 
yeah, I think we screwed up somewhere. Um, <laughs> and actually, the no. screw up was, and usually a screw up will, will cause a failure. But in this case, the assumption was the dust would accumulate and that would be it. But now the wind is blowing it off, right? That's right. Apparently, um, and, and still, to be honest with you, I'm still curious as to what's happening exactly. Um, are these dust devils, are they, are they passing weather fronts? They don't happen very often. But when they do, it's stunning how well, how effective they are. Literally, the solar panels are scrubbed clean, like uh, and almost you know, sandblasted clean. So many of us think that that the wind is moving so fast that it's entrained very tiny f dust particles, and they're just slamming into the into the solar panels and basically knocking off the dust that has accumulated over the months before wow. the, the 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 cleaning event we call it. Right. So so what's so cool about that? We actually get um, we actually get. Uh, 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 restored mission. There are many times this has happened where the vehicles actually back to brand new. It's like some sort of Martian with Windex went ee, 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 squeeze, 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 starting to clean the whole thing Maybe off. He's right behind the camera doing that. You never. Yeah, know. exactly. <laughs> it's the strangest thing. Um, so yeah. it, it's a it really uh, surprised us. The other thing that surprised us is just how long the vehicle was able to last um, in the environment. Um, we, we did something different. We, we really worked really hard to thermally enclose electronics to make sure that the temperature inside, because Mars has these incredible weather extremes. It gets, it gets really hot, almost room temperature in the summertime. And in, this, in, the, in the wintertime it could, and at night, it could get down well below 100 degrees uh, uh, centigrade. And so it's really cold. I mean, it's super cold. <laughs> right. And so uh, th th those, with, uh, imagine leaving your television out outside in the wintertime. Um, you just don't expect it to last. Or just the um, batteries too. I mean, I've, I've been out in cold with my camera and seeing you know, my battery life plummet in just earth cold temperatures, not Martian cold temperatures. So it's just working well beyond you ever thought it would, I guess. Huh? That's exactly right. And so, so with, with those better conditions, um, um, the vehicle is, you know, with, with these well insulated electronics and battery, the temperature has been pretty mild hmm. and they just lasted and lasted um, so much longer than we expected that, that we're, 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 you know, we're just stunned at the, at the, at the quality of the, of the mission. And, and with a rover that can move and without the, and especially without the motors breaking, um, we've had uh, actuators fail. Um, we had the, the, for some reason, the front right wheel seems to be a problem on both rovers. One steering actually didn't work, the other one, the wheel stopped turning on Spirit. Um, and other, we've had other problems with the, with the joints on the robotic arms. But, but uh, you know, it's without these, you know, th this is just a real shock at how long, how long they lasted compared to how long they, we tested them. We tested them for a far shorter period of time, thinking they'd only have to last 90 days. Right, and then of course now we've got ten over ten years out of eleven years almost on on opportunity and still exactly. And still going. Oh, that's right. In about a month, it'll be it'll be a, less than a month. It'll be a, a eleven years. Yeah, it's incredible. incredible. Time flies. Yeah. It's really amazing. Now I want to ask you, yeah. you know, because I was reading the book too. This this book is not, you know, it's in the engineering section on on Amazon and everything. But this is more than an engineering book. I mean, it's really, um, I think it's a management book. It talks about, I mean, really any problem you could. You're, you're at the extreme problem solving uh, side of the, of the world, but any problem can be kind of broken out into these compartments. But what I found interesting about JPL and your time there is that, you know, it seems to be a very merit based place that you're, you're, you're as good as your success rate, as good as your skills as an engineer. You started there, um, you, were, you said you were a student that really wasn't into school and you, you saw this picture in a book about um, these guys who were landing or sending space probes out into the solar system, and that that struck something in you, with, it, with you. So, what happened? You saw that picture, you read that article, you read that book, and now all of a sudden you became engaged. What happened early on that got you on well, this path? I mean, for me, it, it, getting it, having a, uh, I mean, you know, it, 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 you know, I was growing up in the in the in the days of Apollo when people when men were going t to the moon. Uh, the, the, the much of the country was engaged in. You know, there's, there was the Vietnam War going on. There's a lot of there's a lot of strife. But the great thing about the technological side, there, there seemed to be an excitement and a happiness and a sense of progress by going out and designing and building these things. And 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 back then, particularly our understanding of the planets and the and, the, and outer space was so rudimentary compared to what it is today. Um, so we had our uh, for me, it was a, a sense of just incredible curiosity and interest. In wanting to get involved in this sort of stuff, and so even at a very early age, I was I was very lucky to um, to you know 
had the focus to want to continue to do that. And at every chance in my career, I've had I've taken the pathway that allowed me to get further and deeper into that. And so um, a lot of it is luck. You know, I you know you don't you know I I, I consider myself very very lucky to have had, followed the steps that allowed this stuff to happen for me. And uh, uh, and so I, I feel like I sh should share a bit of it, and I did with my book. And it's great, I'm, and I really again hope people do check it out because it was it's an interesting story. And when you got to JPL, this wasn't you weren't landing rockets on Mars right off the bat. You were doing pretty mundane work, and you said there was a lucky break that happened. So what was so you know what was the work that you did before you got to do something a, a lot more interesting? Well, I, 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 to be honest, all of it was very interesting, even the, even when I first got there. But I, I have to admit the work. In fact, you know, even now uh, the work can be very mundane. Mo most people. Uh, most of the engineers at JPL, uh, when they work, they're, they're, it's it's a slow plod going through enormous amount of minutia and detail. Um, and, and although we, we use a lot more computers today than we did when I started, it's still a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of very f fine detail to get you, to get the job done. It, it takes a long time before a robotic arm is actually reaching out and grabbing a rock. I mean, the amount of work to get there is unbelievable. But when I started, um, I, they I, I really start off as a draftsman, um, working, um, uh, putting uh, with pencil, uh, putting all the pin numbers on all the electronic schematics uh, that were really lit written on in pencil on big sheets of vellum. Which we would then run through a not a Xerox machine, but a but a uh, a, a machine using uh, uh, to make blueprints with ammonia. So so we would run it through this bath of ammonia, and out would come this this b beautiful big sheet of blue paper, s you know, sticking up the whole room. But that <laughs> we would make dozens of copies of those and sh and share them with the other engineers, and the engineers would read them and f make mis if they find something wrong, they would use a colored pencil and we would go through and modify the, the, the design by hand. And so we were building computers. The fact that these are the computers that were that flew on the Galileo mission to Jupiter uh, that, that launched uh, in the 80s, but it was, uh, I think it was like 89 is when it launched. It, it explored Jupiter, but, but, but it started back in the late 70s and, and, and all this work I was doing was in the, was, was in the very early 80s. Um, and we finally got these things built. Um, so I started there with that kind of level of detail, and I worked my way up as a technician, working on um, putting electronics together, um, uh, you know, l l using an oscilloscope and 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 probing the various points on the, on these on these breadboards with all these wire wrap pins, thousands of wire wrap pins, and it was just a very uh, it was for me it was still exciting because I'm working on stuff that's going to outer space. I mean, right. yeah, the work itself is mundane, but I know the stuff I'm doing is going to have some value uh, someday when it finally gets in orbit around Jupiter. So it's nothing like, nothing stranger or more amazing than, than holding on a piece of electronics and you're going like, this is going to outer space someday. Wow, wow. That's and so, cool. yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, to me it was, it was just a, a dream come true. So then you went from there onto the Mars Pathfinder mission, and and now you were so, responsible for a lot more than just the entry yeah, so, the system. So after, exactly. So so for Mars Pathfinder, um, having gotten good electronics, I was the chief engineer for Cassini's computers, which are still in orbit around Saturn. Um, got those computers working, but then then a, a guy named Brian Muirhead, um, the, the, the 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 spacecraft manager for Pathfinder, uh, he and I had lunch, and he said, "Hey Rob, would you would you?" You know, I, I could use a chief engineer. You know, I'm really good at mechanical stuff, but I really don't know much about electronics and software. So, could you join me and help me on that side? And I said, Shh, yes, that would be <laughs> right. so cool. You know, I, I all I known about this project so far was that there was this bunch of guys who would conceive this idea of bouncing, um, uh, or not, actually, not at that time they weren't going to bounce. So it was going to go pfft, like this. Oh, just like stick a, into the ground. Baseball stick, yeah. Wow. And so. Um, and there were no rockets and no, it was just a very simple uh, idea that they'd had. And so, so I came up. Controlled splat, was that the? Uh... <laughs> controlled splat, yeah. It was basically a, vented, a bag with vented airbags. Okay. That was so, so, so it wouldn't bounce at all. Okay, it's kind of like fact, when a stuntman jumps off a building, it just, yeah. just the place, right? Right. Um, we found later on, um, uh, we discovered that we, we, we those vents were not, we couldn't get the timing right. Um, so we said, just, hey, screw the vents. Let's just bounce and bounce and bounce, and so we ended up bouncing on Mars for a kilometer, wow. um, and uh, uh, 
having to deal with not one landing, but dozens. Right. <laughs> and you're watching this come back, right? You're seeing these, these radio signals come back, indicating oh, that you well, were bouncing? It, uh, well, in, in those days, we had a radio signal coming back, but the radio signal, when you're, as you're bouncing, is nothing more than a tone. Oh, okay. Freak, I mean, all you can hear, in fact, even that goes away and comes back. So because the signal is so weak, you have no information content. It's just all, it's like, it's just a presence or absence of a signal. And so while it's bouncing, the signal um, turned out because how it was, uh, Pathfinder was bouncing. It was actually bouncing in such a way that the antenna tended to point more toward Earth. So we could actually see the signal. So while, so I knew it was bouncing because of, of the timeline. I, did, I had a clock and I had a timeline in front of me. So I could tell, yeah. If you're getting a signal from Mars, it means that you're bouncing on the surface of Mars or have already landed. So, so when we saw that signal, we knew it was, you know, it it, it had land, had at least made contact with Mars and was still working. And, and so I, I didn't know what condition it was. It may have been a heap of metal for all I knew. <laughs> but that radio is still pinging. And right? then tail going, eh, yeah. <laughs> and the thing that people don't get, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is that you don't really test the whole system before it goes right there's tests of components and whatever but you put this thing together you put your best effort into it and then what <laughs> no it, uh no it it's it, what, what we because it was it turns out that, yeah you're absolutely right mars and earth are so different that we really can't do a systematic entry descent landing test if you remember the orion test from from a week ago uh that was a fantastic test i was so jealous because they can do a full up test and, of their whole approach and entry descent and landing process um, and do it safely without, you know, without the mission being uh, compromised due to a failure. Yet, um, so they were able to pull it off on Earth, but on Mars, I can't do that without going to Mars. And so <laughs> Mars is so different. So, so our first test is the actual landing on Mars. Now. You know, to, to, we do instead. He says, "We've got it." You know, we just can't just cross our fingers. So what we do is we test all the different pieces. We test the the, the airbags. We we take them in a world's largest vacuum chamber in, in Sandusky, Ohio, and bounce them on on sharp rocks on a sixty degree rock platform that's that's forty feet high, fifty feet high, boom, and catch it in a big catch net. Um, and we do this over and over again to make sure the airbags work. We test the parachutes separately. We test the uh, the rockets separately. We tested the the, the 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 sending on a bridle separately. And we do all these tests individually. And we hope that the system works. But but to, to get our self confidence, we put mo computers. We create, create computer models of all these different pieces. So you, so really have a full up simulation of our vehicle, including its software. And we put that all together into a simulated Mars environment. So it's a bit like our, we, 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 uh, our vehicle becomes alive in the computer and we wrap it like, like the matrix, right. wrap it around a simulated Mars environment and then we count how many times this, this thing, we run it over and look for cases where it doesn't work. And so, we, so, we, so we, that's how we fine tune the software, that's how we fine tune um, our sel selection of the landing site. So all these things we put together. Now we tried that first for Pathfinder and we really, since then, we've really gone crazy with these simulations and these simulations have become, as we, now we've evolved into these simulations for uh, Curiosity Rover. These computer simulations are mind-bogglingly big, run th hundreds of thousands, millions of times on these supercomputers. Um, in fact, we re rerun them right leading up until landing, the moment of landing wow. uh, here on Earth while it's going on to make sure that we've tuned everything up just right so it lands safely. And what people also need to understand too, that when they see these images of the control room, um, you're not controlling anything at that point, are you? I mean, once that, that sequence begins, you're just a spectator like all of us, right? Right, in fact, you know, the, the, the dirty secret is that we don't even have to be there. Um, <laughs> but well, the reason we're there, we, we do, we are the, the, up until about uh, an hour before landing. It is possible there are contingencies where we might send commands to the vehicle, uh, and and to to if something bad looks bad to happen, there we, there are certain options. Uh, for example, hitting the reset button on the computer. Mm -hmm. Right. We could do that from Earth. Uh, we have to you know have to make sure we don't do it too late because we have to wait for the signal. We said, we said, oh, hit the reset button. We hit the button. The signals go across 
the solar system, it takes in the, in the case of Curiosity Landing Day, 13 minutes to get there. So, you know, you know, if you if you if you wait too late, um, and the, the the seven minutes of entry descent landing, the seven minutes of terror, we call it, will have been over with by the time you <laughs> reset signal got there. So you have to make sure that you do if there's a problem, there. that you do it early enough so it gets there in time to do it. Do it. In fact, on Pathfinder, we came this close to hitting the reset button. Um, literally um, uh, about 25 minutes before landing, it was very terrifying. But we didn't, right? Uh, because we realized we didn't need to. But it's, uh, uh, but uh, there's most of these people who are sitting there. All they're doing is they're looking at their. They have their own display. Now, what's happened since Pathfinder? Um, now you you said you asked about what we can watch. Well, it turns out with with orbiters in orbit around Mars. They can listen in to what the ro rover has to say while it's landing, and so the rover is transmitting uh, using its little its UHF walkie-talkie uh, and transmitting back all the way up to one of we uh, we 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 time it so that uh, Odyssey space orbiter is there, the Odyssey Mars Odyssey spacecraft, uh, Mars reconnaissance orbiter is there. It's recording everything and taking a, uh, an image of right. the descent. Right, that's um, amazing to see that parachute coming down, and it's yes. incredible. Yeah, cool. And, and then, and then have a whole on, network there now, right? There's what three right, or four. Mars orbiters? Express is there. Um, we we had we had three spacecraft when Curiosity landed. Three spacecraft were listening in, and 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 Odyssey was taking every bit it, it got and quickly forwarding it back to Earth. So we were watching the data come in through the Odyssey spacecraft. Um, while well, the other vehicles were recording, and so it was really an amazing, you know, con uh, kind of a constellation computer net, like a, a network, uh, uh, that all focused on that same over Gale crater all at the same time. And that's a lot and of so work too, just to get everything. I mean, these things are in orbit; they're not they're not geostationary. So you've got to get all these things in the right place at the right time, and you have to time it so that they're they're right over the, coming over the horizon just as this thing was entering Mars, and they go like this, they pass each other. Right. So, so the entry system, the, uh, uh, Curio so Curiosity is coming this way, and, and uh, M Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is coming to the south, I mean, from the, uh, from, the, from the north, looking down and trying to keep his camera uh, on, uh, looking at the timing, timing it so that it takes an image just where, think, where the rover is on its parachute. Meanwhile, Odyssey is going in the other direction, coming back this way, a little bit higher, uh, and passing and taking images on on the way and uh, and not images but uh, collecting the data and forwarding it back to Earth. All of that's happening at the same moments. Pretty amazing. And so it it takes months of preparation and uh, practice to get that right. And I'm going to play a video real quick. We we uh, we had some people go to the clean room at uh, KSC right before launch of Curiosity, and I don't think people realize how big it is. This is like the size I would say of like a golf cart. It seems to be like you could almost ride on it. It's that big. Oh yeah, it's I, it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's the size of a small car. It's, it's incredibly large, and and you know this oh, is this creates yeah. a big problem. You can't bounce that. So you you came right. up with this idea of the of the sky crane um, and you and I'm sure there was a whole team that debated this and, and I yeah. read in the book it was quite a, a long process to convince people yeah, that yeah, this years. is the way to go. Yeah. Um, it, it seemed, did it seem crazy to you when you thought when you thought of this idea that this was the way to, to bring this down? And I'm going to play this uh, animation while you talk here so people can see exactly how it works. No, actually I, I, it, it, I was very frustrated. I had been building a lander for Mars sample return. We thought we were going to do Mars sample return in the 2003-2005 window, but and we were building a, I was working with my friends at Lockheed Martin in Denver, and we were trying to build this big lander which carried a large rocket on top, and then that rocket had a bigger, a big rover straddled on top of it. And it, the more we worked it, the more, the more I just realized that this thing was just never going to get there. It was, it had such, it was, it was, all the mass we're putting on top was making it top heavy. We want it, it, the larger it got, the larger the ground clearance needed to be because there were more rocks that was likely to be underneath it. The tanks were big; they were protruding down toward the ground. Um, everything, and then the, and then the problem is once you landed, the rover was still a meter to two meters above the surface of Mars, and we needed these big heavy ramps, and the whole thing was getting uglier and more complicated and and it and it was getting more massive i just couldn't get it to the surface so so uh several of us thought there was something wrong so i went through and made a a possibility of using comparing viking pathfinder 
and other landing ideas that we'd had over the years. And I put it on a piece of paper and drew out a kind of a cartoon of how the possibilities and what struck out with me and, and something we'd actually g joked about in previous years is is what if we converted pa put Pathfinder landing system and if you if you convert the rockets from solid rockets to liquid throttle rockets the throttle rockets that we didn't have on Pathfinder then we could then we wouldn't be so sloppy about dropping off the airbag on the surface of Mars we can actually control it so that so that the the airbags can be dropped and laid right down and kiss the surface of Mars and then we can cut the cable and the thing could fly and the rockets could fly away well that'd be cool. If you do that, then why do you need airbags? I right. Go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't need airbags. But well, but you'd have to. But now you're you're now you're suspending something on the. Here's this. This is my. Uh, I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, your Apple Power adapter there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is a pendulum, right? Right. And so what's cool about a pendulum is that you know it. Uh, I mean, this is very much like the, our our rover with the descent stage above it. But, if, but a lot of people said, you know, this thing is not stable. How do you how do you control it? It's like, you know, things get, get, can get wildly out of control, and this thing can uh, slam sideways into a rock. The wheels would never survive that. And then it dawned on us that the way that we do um, testing, uh, the way we, the, the way a human being would stop a pendulum, is a lot easier than people think. Check this out. How long do you suppose it would take me, if I close my eyes, to stop it from swinging? With my eyes closed. Watch this. Wow. It's almost instant. Right. I have an algorithm in my head. Like a muscle memory. It's, it's 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 not even it's not that anyone can do it, and they all know how to do it instantly. And the reason people know how to do it is because what they do is your body automatically feels the force that's being pulled on this way. And then they move their hand to compensate, and what, so so all so all you have to do to slow down the damping to damp these motions is to is to move in the direction you're being pulled. Right. So if you have a computer that do that, it. that's it. Yeah, and it turns out that's a really easy algorithm to write, and in writing software. And so we trained our descent stage to do that, and the rover uh, to 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 do exactly that, and voila. We were able to make the thing go rock solid straight down without swinging, and so that turned out to be a a, a a huge, huge plus. And we realized that this, you know, this is not so crazy. But it took us a couple of years to realize that, and we uh, because a lot of the criticism about this design was the instability of the control right. system with the pendulum hanging below. And you had a helicopter pilot involved with this too, right? Well, essentially we realized, you know, you know, we're not the only human beings that have this problem. You know, uh, people who fly uh, 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 cargo helicopters who deliver payloads carefully to the surface, such, such as Skiorsky helicopter pilots, um, they can land their sky crane helicopter, it's a sky crane brand helicopter, um, with, 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 with their payloads with incredible precision, even under windy conditions. And we said, we asked ourselves, well, how is that possible? And we, we looked into that design and they, we had, we even had some pilots join us in the review of this, of our concept. And they all said, this is, this is not that hard. They it's do it all not, the time. <laughs> they do it all the time. Yeah. And so uh, it was very convincing to a lot of people who were very, initially very skeptical that this idea was actually worth pursuing. Um, now and plus, you know, there plus there's all these other benefits of putting your rocket so far up. Uh, for one, is that the rocket plume, although it can be aimed out away from your vehicle, um, that rocket plume can actually uh, uh, it can, it, it can stay far enough away so it doesn't dig holes in the ground and it doesn't produce it doesn't uh, affect the landing system of uh, the uh, the the touchdown, the landing gear, right. the wheels of the vehicle. Right. And so you can take your jolly time and lower it down at incredibly slow speeds. Whereas the landers we'd had up to that point, uh, um, the Viking landers and Mars Polar Lander, which d unfortunately disappeared, um, was to land as fast as you can on against the legs. And it, you know, it's almost a controlled crash. Right. And then you quickly turn your engines off before it's too late. If you if leave the engines on for even a, even a few milliseconds, the whole thing will pop back in the air and flip over. And so it's <laughs> remarkably... It's a remarkably kind of a dangerous landing, um, and and we even had a, the people who helped design the Apollo lander and analyze the dynamics of the Apollo landing 
that's when we realized is that even that system was incredibly dangerous. Um, if, the, if the astronauts are looking out the window, they really can't see the surface. There's the, 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 the plume is cutting away, removing huge amounts of regolith and just right. slicing the top out. So there'd be a rock underneath that you're not seeing until you land on yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. and so it's too late. And, then, and if you do land on it, you have to know that you're landed on it to quickly shut the engines off. Now they had these, these, these touchdown detectors that they put on the, uh, on the ends of the legs that were po pointed down. Uh, they were designed to move out of the way or get bent. Um, but the, t the reaction time that astronauts needed to, had to be incredibly fast. Um, and and it, was, it was nip and tuck. If you look at the simulations for landing Apollo missions, it was actually not that good unless the astronauts were really quick at it. Um, and they, fortunately, they all were. And that was very convenient. Yeah, right. <laughs> very <laughs> lucky. Yeah. But if they, it's and easy the, to have a bad day. It is. And the computers were getting overloaded, right? Neil Armstrong's mission, that alarm was going off. The computer could not yeah. keep up with the data That's, that oh, it was getting. Yeah, exactly. There, there was a, the, 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 the alarm, the, 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 they had alarm go off that uh, fortunately they had seen before in their testing. They knew it was a, um, it was a, basically the computer running out of time. If you remember that, there was a, right. they had the time slices and, they, and that's, that was kind of scary then too. But it, it was, it was fine. Um, but I have to tell you, um, it, it, this whole idea of lowering down on rope seemed to give us the time. Um, both it, it, because once, even when you touch down, um, there's still time because as, as long as you don't mind the slack that build up and you have a, you can accommodate the slack. And we did, we had little w uh, winches that, that took up the slack of the, of the three cables that went down. Uh, and I, and we had one on the top to pull the, to clean up, to keep the electrical cable from, from getting too slack. Cause we didn't want the stuff draping on a right, rover. Right. Uh, the sense stage to continue down until the rover came to his conclusion that it was safely on the surface of Mars. And you did that by just noticing that you're, you had less um, th uh, thruster uh, need at that point, right? That's how you knew you were on the surface, that the thrusters didn't need. Uh, what, what, isn't, that, isn't that cool? I it mean, was really just, cool. It is coming, it's continued, the, just, the, the inertial measurement system says, keep going at the fixed rate. Okay, I'm going to fixed rate. And it just shuts its engines down because it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need a, a, as much thrust because there's, it's half as heavy as it was before because the rover's on the ground. And so the, all the software has to go is go like, oh my. I just think the engines have cut them, have, 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 have turned themselves down by half. Right. It's only half, they're half, the, half the thrust level. We must be on the ground. Yeah, we don't need a sensor anymore. Just, just yeah. give it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my friend Miguel San Martin, he, he came up with that idea, and I was like, oh, brilliant. And he just noticed it in a simulation. It just stuck out like, hey, look it. Right. I could tell we're on the ground. I don't need a sensor. Yeah. And that would made a lot easier. Hmm. Oh boy, because that was one of the biggest problems. So how do you get a reliable touchdown sensor? Right, and that's the trick. And you know, and and what's really amazing to me about this whole process, and, and I get this from the book as well, that the the business of engineering spacecraft has changed from the standpoint of being able to communicate it properly to people. Right, that we have people yeah. watching now. Times Square is watching you. Right, watching this thing land on the planet didn't happen in the 70s and the 60s. You know, the moon landing was its own thing. The astronauts had, you know, had a bulk of the attention on them. Now it's on the engineers. How, how is, and I'm reading, you know, in the book too, that you were noticing during one of these failed landings that it was chaos in the in mission control and, and this, people are watching this. And now how does that factor in now? What kind of planning do you do to, to prepare for that? Well, it, it, we do have to prepare for that, um, and and it's not it's not even for PR reasons, just so that we don't. First of all, at the time when we we can send commands, we don't send something to the vehicle that can make things worse, and that we're that we're calm and cogent about. It. And if we do some, see something bad while we're landing, that we know how to assess that information, and so that so that you know it could there are many bad things that could happen that still allow the rover to do operations on the surface the following day, um, so, or or do something and or to survive at least. Um, so what we do is we practice. So so we do is we go into that same room. Um, we don't wear the blue shirts. We just wear normal clothes, mm -hmm. and we we uh, take a uh, we instead of using the vehicle that's at Mars or on its way to Mars in this case, we use a, another one here on Earth in our test bed, and we and we make that the vehicle, and we wrap that vehicle around a, a simulate put a simulated Mars around that vehicle. So basically that. That that electronic package, I mean, and, and all the rover and all the equipment is in our in our in our test lab 
we we basically put it, it into a matrix like world where it's it's its whole world it thinks it's on its way to mars it's th as, as it as approaches mars it thinks it's landing on mars and it goes through all the motions of doing the landing and everything including what happens after landing so uh, and having including the communications links and we can take all those communication links and route them back delay them by a lifetime right mm -hmm. and so they write route them back to the uh, to the to the team back in the same dark room um, that you saw before in the operations room where we can you know see what the rover sees and see what we'll be seeing on the night of the real event and so it, we practice this several times both under nominal conditions and off nominal conditions and I talked a little bit about the off nominal conditions right. in my book right. and there's quite a few of those to plan for so and, yeah. and just from, from you as an engineer I mean you got into this career before uh, having to communicate effectively to the public was something that engineers had to do on a regular basis um, how has that been challenging for you as someone who's uh, you know, you're the public face and the internal face. I mean, you, you've run, you know, a pretty sizable sides. operation here. Yeah. Well, we do. We do. You know, all of us do both, and, and, and if most of us are. You know, we're engineers first. We're not. We're not public uh, figures necessarily. But we're. Uh, but we we have learned to talk to people, um, and we do that part of because you know I mentioned how tedious the work can be and how long. Uh, you know how how, you know. It, it's very cool stuff, but it can be an enormous drudgery, uh, and and very and very you know a lot of paperwork, a lot of a, a lot of testing, triple checking, doing redundant work with other people to because we sh everyone has to check each other. Um, so it's, it's it's that the work itself you can start forgetting that you're working on something really cool. Right. One way to find out that you work remind yourself that you're working on something very cool is to go out and talk to kids. Or talk to the public, and go to libraries, go to go to uh, community clubs, or or high schools, or junior highs, and and give public talks. And so we have many of our engineers go out and talk, and and you know they get a lot out of it because you know as I do, um, because you, you start sharing this stuff, and you realize, oh my gosh, my job is really cool. I'd almost forgotten. Right, it's kind of you therapeutic, know? isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's very th therapeutic, and, and you can come back very much more inspired about the work you're doing by going out and doing it and talking about it. That's great. We do have a viewer question, which I, I think we we touched on. Maybe we can just touch on it again real quick. Um, and I, I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Angirius Krishna wants to know if the rovers take help from other satellites in Mars orbit, which we talked about, right? A lot of the communication yeah. goes through all those satellites on orbit, right? In fact, um, I would say it would, by far the bulk of the data the images you see from the surface of Mars now, from both rovers, I mean, for well, from all three rovers while they were alive, and to, to, certainly Opportunity and Curiosity today, all come through one of our orbiters, uh, either Odyssey or Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, or Mars Express, the European uh, satellite. Um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, with its bigger antenna and its larger ra ra transmitter, radio transmitter, is the winner by hands down. It, it was designed to be the spy satellite around Mars with this fantastic high-rise camera they can see incredible detail um, so it's got so in order to get all those pictures back this uh, terabytes worth of data um, it's, it required this very large antenna uh, and a very large radio and so um, our little rover which has a small antenna all that but it doesn't need a big antenna in order to just right. talk to the orbiter because yeah. it only it comes by uh, twice a day for about 10 minutes roughly mm -hmm. 10 minutes uh, and over those 10 minutes it goes I have some pictures for you as the or as the orbiter flies overhead um, from uh, and, and over that period of time the, the the orbiter says thank you very much and it turns its antenna and go splat back to Earth. And how um, fast is the data rate back to Earth? Uh, the data rate can be quite fast. It's uh, it's in the order of many megabits per second. So comparable to like a cable modem or a DSL connection at home, yeah. perhaps? Yeah, or better. Yeah, wow. yeah. In fact. Um, it's uh, our. Uh, I think uh, I'd be honest with you. I can't remember the top data rate that Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has. But the but the data rate that we can we can get um, from our or from our lander to the orbiter, we can get uh, uh, you know uh, many several, a couple of megabytes megabits per second um, on the on the link to to the orbiter while it's going over it for five minutes. If we're trying to talk to Earth directly. It's much more like the old-fashioned modems, you know. We're, right. we're getting um, seven thousand bits per second. Okay, so about seven, seven was that seven thousand baud or so, give or take? Or <laughs> that's, 
Exactly. Yeah, so pretty, pretty back in my day when I was on my BBS, that was probably exactly. fast. But yeah. Um, so one last question. Well, two last questions for you. Uh, what's next? We have uh, Europa. I, I saw that there was some money in the budget now to start thinking about Europa, and and we have more to do on Mars. So what what, what can we expect in the coming years? Well, it, there, there, there's several things we're going through. There is another spacecraft, another Mars mission being designed right now, um, being been built built. Uh, at in the Lockheed plant that we're working with them on there, it's called Insight. It's a it's a Mars lander that's going to land near the equator of Mars, and its job is not to look at rocks, but to look down inside Mars. Oh, really? It's going to it's it's got a seismometer. It's going to look at the heat rate, and, and it's got a little device to to, to go to, to peer down under the rock. And so it's it's really a a, a mission to understand the sh the. Mars as a planet, particularly whether or not the internal parts of the planet are still active. Hmm. Uh, it, are there are there Mars quakes? Are there? We, we there's no doubt there are plenty of uh, 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 past volcanoes and fat, past earthquake faults. But how many are there active? Are they active today? We don't really know. We'd like to find out. And uh, is that one landing the same way that Curiosity did, or is it a different landing? No, system? it's 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 the same. It's it's really a repeat of Phoenix. If you remember Phoenix, uh, three-legged lander, the land of the North Pole of Mars, and it and it landed lasted just uh, the summer of 2007. Uh, yeah, 2007 or 2008. I'm trying to get my memories going here. But it, it landed and it had a scoop and it scratched the surface of the North Pole and literally that far underneath the dirt wow. was this beautiful white. Blue white. Oh, I remember ice. seeing that. Yeah, was that water ice? That was that was pure. It was ice. Nothing wow. but ice. That's amazing. That must was that expected or that was unexpected? Um, we 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 it was a bit of both. Um, we from orbit we could actually see uh, the signs of ice in North Pole from 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 the, a gamma ray spectrometer on board the Odyssey spacecraft. We could see lots of hydrogen. But we didn't know what kind of hydrogen it was. Was it hydrogen in the minerals? Was it actually pure water in the form of frozen water? And and to our shock, it was frozen water very close to the surface wow. and vast amounts of it. That's and cool. the question is, what was a little surprising is, how did that water, you know, how come the water didn't evaporate, right. you know, sublimate? Yeah. And, and um, it turns out that that water uh, was protected not just by that layer, but because it has, it was a very briny water, very salty. Um, it, ke it kept the it kept the uh, the, w the water intact, um, which you know you might say, well, water, a uh, water frozen water that's salty is that good for? Does that bode well for the possibility that life once lived on Mars? Well, if you go to to Curiosity's landing site, we found that the uh, right off the bat in our first drill hole, we found that the, that Mars in fact was habitable for life in many three and a half billion years ago. The clays that we drove on were laid down uh, in 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 a lake, and 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 with fresh water that was not acidic, that was not too salty. It was just right for single cell organisms organisms to survive. And just last week, we announced that um, we discovered that that in fact this lake in this in this crater that we're in now had been there for many, many millions of years and lay down many layers of sediments over, over those millions of years, billions of years ago now, three and a half billion years ago. So, it, it, so that really bodes well for the possibility that life may have survived and uh, uh, thrived on Mars long ago. Now, the, so the real question is, we don't really know. We, we, need, we haven't seen any life on Mars. So, so we're hoping that over the next couple of years that uh, uh, Curiosity rover might look for and discover uh, uh, remaining organic residue from past life. That would be so exciting if that were true. It's incredible what we've learned, isn't it? Yeah, and and to, and, and the and the follow up thing is, we, he says, well, so we really, if, we, if that's the case, we, we'd really like to know more because our older rover is very capable vehicle, has this wonderful scientific ensemble of equipment, uh, like mass spectrometer, gas chromatograph. But but one but one of the things that we'd really like to do is bring samples back. So starting in 2020, we're going to land another via version of the Curiosity rover. Uh, right now, it's we call the mission the 2020 mission. Uh, but it's going to land, and it's going to collect cores from rock, little tiny pencil-like cores. And we're gonna, it's going to collect them up into a pile. And we'll be able to come back later and collect all those and put them on a rocket and put them into Mars orbit inside a, a orbiting vehicle about the size of over a little bit size larger than a grapefruit, 
uh, and that will that will then will be picked up by yet another orbiter, which will take it back to Earth. Well, that, that sounds like it's going to be pretty complicated. Yeah, it is. But that's it's your a, job, right? <laughs> is to solve exactly. the problems. Now, let me ask you this one last question, which is, um, you know, I, I, being a manager, and I've managed things before as well, when you, your mission's successful, whatever you set out to do is successful, you know what didn't go right during that first process. What, what are you looking at with this new lander that, you know, using the same technology on the 2020 mission, what did you learn from uh, Curiosity's landing that you might change in the future? Well, there are there, there's several things that we're looking at. One, one is, is that we would like to be able to put this down on landing areas that have, uh, it's, it turns out it's really hard to find a, a, a large, flat, safe place to land that's also nearby scientifically interesting places. So one of the things we'd like to do is, is look for the, uh, the uh, be able to land this vehicle on a place where there are known escarpments, you know, places like where there are some, uh, Places that would normally consider be considered dangerous, but they're not too dangerous to drive around. Um, so what we'd like to do is give our vehicle a sense of vision. So we're looking at putting a lander vision system so it looks out the window when it's about to ready to land, and if it sees that it's going to land in a place that's dangerous, it will divert using an you know it has its own map and it says well. Looks like I'm gonna land here. That's a hazardous point. The scientist told me that this is a dangerous place, so I'm gonna move 600 meters over to the right. And land land there when I know it's safe. So we're looking at putting a new landing revision system on board. We're also looking at ways to improve our ability to uh, to make the vehicle go, uh, be able to move faster and do uh, to make bigger, better progress um, operationally. Um, Curiosity uh, is a very slow rover. Um, we knew it was going to be slow when we built it, um, uh, but it's 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 it. A lot of scientists would love it to be more productive. Um, and be able to get more science done per month than we do. Um, we, we've had a lot of issues that slowed us down. Um, uh, we've had technical problems, but but we've we've solved them as we've gone, uh, including uh, another one is a big one is if you remember the wheels on Curiosity rover are uh, they've been poked through the rocks. Have been, the right. the rocks. You know I, that was you know it, it, talk about a, uh, a you know a big mistake on my part and our team's part. We basically didn't we did not test those wheels on the right surfaces, and so uh, we we've been doing that now, and we understand now that we didn't we under test we under we, we under designed them. The wheels are too thin. We're going to make them thicker and allow them to be able to to survive um, the sharp pointy rocks that are embedded in Mars clay that we didn't envision. Um, remember, you know, think about this. We're going to a place where there's wet. It's supposed to be very old. If it was wet, if there are rocks there, they might be embedded in clays. If they're embedded in clays for hundreds of millions of years, it's not going to move, right? It's going to happen. The, the wind's going to grind them into these right. sharp little points. And you no, know, we just didn't put those pieces together in our heads, and we didn't test. We put rocks on the soil, but we didn't put them that way. We didn't right. glue. We didn't make a bed of nails. Wow. But, so we'll fix that too. So lots to come. <laughs> yeah. so, and it seems like even having all these billions of dollars that you're responsible for and all these exciting, you, you seem really excited and happy and not even stressed about all this stuff. This has got to be an it's, exciting job. You just, you know, it's all it is is work. And you just get it done, you crank through it, and, and then you put all the pieces together and hope that you didn't forget something. And that's, that is the whole, that's our job in a nutshell. Well, that's fantastic. Rob, I really appreciate you uh, spending the time to talk to me today. Uh, I've been great. following yeah. your career. You, you know, it's going to creep you up. I've been following your career and those of many other JPL people for a long time since, you know, oh, probably fantastic. 17 or 18 years now. And I've been just such a fan of what you all have done um, for the space program, for the country, for humanity, really. I mean, it's, well, it's we're learning a lot from all the work that you've done and it's really inspiring. So. Thank you, Lon. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, your listeners. This is really a lot of fun for me, too. Great. Well, thank you, Rob, again. And the book is called Mars Curiosity. You can find it on Amazon. It's linked below uh, in the uh, video description, and you can find that uh, right there. And it's a great gift or a great book to read. And even though it's in the engineering section, this is a really fun read about some really exciting stuff. This is Lon Sivan. Thanks for watching.